Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Thomas Kukowski. I'm from University of Sydney University. Um, so it looks like there's going to be some similarities between our papers, briefly, which I thought was interesting. You mentioned the Council on Foreign Relations, as well as uh, Jay, as well, you mentioned uh, the internal forces in Syria, how they compete with one another. Okay, that's good. Okay, so what will I be speaking about today? Um, my paper is more about the context of the Syrian war, um, less about the war itself. Uh, what gave rise to it? Why is it happening now? And why is Syria important? It's actually a particularly important country. Um, so what I want to talk about is the uh, historical context, uh, the competing pipelines, and the regional geo strategies behind them. Um, U.S. attempts to overthrow both the Assads, not just Bashar, uh, Hafez as well. Uh, the regional context, um, the Iran-Qatar pipelines. Um, Iran and Qatar are major gas producers in the Middle East. Um, and they need pipelines to get their gas to important markets in Europe. Um, the 4C strategy uh, with Bashar al-Assad. Uh, then the international context, which is particularly relevant, uh, between Russia's support for Bashar al-Assad and the United States and Europe's opposition to him. And then I wanted to talk about some conclusions and questions that this raises. Okay, so first, historical context. Uh, the construction of the Trans-Arabian Pipeline begins in 1947. Uh, it was mainly managed by the American company Bechtel, which is a major influence in American politics today, closely linked to the Bush family, actually. Um, this started shortly after the discovery of oil in around the late 20s, early 30s. Um, CIA operations to overthrow President uh, Shukri al khat in March 1949 and replace him with someone more amenable. Um, the Hafez, Hafez al-Assad becomes president of Syria in 1971 and the Ba'ath Party rule begins, uh, which is the Ba'ath Party's an anti-imperial Arab socialist party. Um, in the year 2000, Bashar al-Assad uh, succeeds Hafez after his death. Um, and it's just it's a picture of Bashar al-Assad there, the second from the left. He's in his late 20s there. This was taken around 1994, I believe. Okay, so more about historical context. This is a, a document released by WikiLeaks. Um, it's a CIA document from 1983. Um, I thought I put this in because I thought it expressed Syria's uh, regional position well. Um, I tried to highlight the top part, but it wouldn't let me. So I might just read out the top part, which I think is particularly relevant. This is in 1983 now. Um, Syria at present has a hammerlock, hammerlock on U.S. interests both in Lebanon and in the Gulf. The Gulf meaning oil reserves and access. Uh, through closure of Iraq's pipeline, thereby threatening uh, Iraqi internationalization of the war. This means Iraq's war against Iran. Uh, the U.S. should consider sharply escalating the pressures on our side against um, against Assad through covertly orchestrating simultaneous military threats against Syria from three warring states, I'll start to Syria, um, Iraq, Israel, and Turkey. So I think this sets Syria's importance to the United States and demonstrates that the US has had you know, long designs on achieving a political situation in Syria which is more amenable to its own interests. In other words, a pro-US regime in Syria. Um, more about Wikileaks, from Wikileaks. This is moving forward to 2006 now. This is by uh, William Roebuck, the then US ambassador uh, to Syria. And the report that he wrote, he wrote here, uh, influencing the Syrian Arab government at the end of 2006, it's uh, around a six or seven page document. It's a memorandum going back to Washington from the Syrian embassy, US, uh, sorry, the US embassy in Syria. Um, this is the conclusion, which I think is particularly relevant for Syria. Um, the analysis leaves out anti-regime Syrian Islamists because it is difficult to get an accurate picture of the threat uh, within Syria that such groups pose. This is prior to the formation of ISIS. Al-Qaeda was relatively limited by this stage in its reach throughout the Middle East, although Iraq, of course, gave a huge impetus to that. Um, they are certainly a long-term threat. While it alludes to the vulnerabilities that Syria faces, because of its alliances with Iran, it does not elaborate fully on this topic. So in other words, up until this point, they were talking about various strategies to pressure us, uh, vulnerabilities that exist within 
Syria, how they might get exploited. Um, the report, the, or the memorandum, talks a lot about uh, creating uh, threatening situations that might force Assad to overreact, uh, which could then be used as a pretext for either regime change or intervention, <coughs> with the objective of regime change. Um, uh, the bottom line is that uh, Bashar is entering the new year, uh, meaning 2006, in a stronger position than he has been in several years, they mean domestically. Uh, both those strengths also carry with them, or sometimes mask vulnerabilities. Uh, if we are ready to capitalize, they will offer us the opportunities to disrupt his decision making, keep him off balance, and make him pay a premium for his mistakes. So, in other words, mistakes meaning assuming if there were long attacks, something happens domestically within the country. A lot of the report focuses on, on how to essentially cause Bashar al-Assad to overreact and play these up in the Western media. And we've seen that with Richard Murdoch generally comes along when that happens. Um, this is a Rand Corporation report too, moving forward to 2008. And this ties in, I think, with probably two of the other, with the, those two papers. Um, this talks about uh, the various militant groups, Islamic groups, within Syria. And this report is publicly released as well, unfolding the war uh, of the long, unfolding the future of the long war. This was done by the Rand Corporation, cooperation with the Arroyo Center. Okay, um, so the Biden rule focuses on exploiting the fault lines between various Salafi jihadist groups to turn them against each other and dissipate their energy on internal conflicts. So in other words, as the previous two speakers said, you get people fighting each other in turn. This, way can, this has the effect of weakening state structures, meaning the army, the government, which can then be easily overcome with outside military force. The strategy relies heavily on covert action, information operations, meaning propaganda, unconventional warfare, and support for indigenous security forces, or at least indigenous security forces that can be brought over. We saw that in the movie as well, where various Libyan forces were brought over to the side of various terror groups that were fighting Gaddafi. Uh, the United States and its local allies could use the national jihad jihadists to launch proxy information operation <coughs> campaigns to discredit the transnational jihadists in the eyes of the local populace. Uh, US leaders could also choose to capitalize on the sustained Sunni-Shia conflict, as our two speakers, previous speakers said, um, trajectory by taking the side of conservative Sunni regimes against Shia empowerment movements in the Muslim world, possibly supporting authoritative uh, Sunni governments against continually hostile Iran. Okay, so we mentioned, them. so that sets, I think, some of the domestic uh, context for Syria. Now, the Qatar versus Iran pipeline, this is particularly relevant, I think. Uh, the Qatar pipeline is the one in blue, and the Iran-based pipeline is the one in red, and they're both going towards Europe. And you'll notice which country they're going through, Syria. Um, the thing about Syria is that it's the last independent government in the Middle East, except in Iran, which is technically not a Middle Eastern country. Um, having, given that it's essentially a transit nation, it needs a government which is going to be compliant with whoever is going to run that pipeline through that country. Um, so, the Iran-Iraq Syria pipeline uh, was chosen by, uh, sort of favored by Assad in 2011. Uh, they signed an historic pipeline energy agreement which would take uh, Iranian gas through Syria, possibly Iraqi gas as well, all of the countries essentially been destroyed, uh, through Turkey into Europe. Europe is the major destination for both of these countries, for Qatar and Iran. Uh, and they need pipelines, of course, to get their gas there. Uh, the pipeline was envisioned to cost $10 billion and take three years to complete. Uh, it would run from the Iranian port of Asalia near South Paz gas fields, uh, that's out in the Gulf, uh, to Damascus in Syria via Iraqi territory. Um, so as I said, Syria is a, a transit nation. And if you're going to run pipelines through this country, you need to have a compliant government. This has been, the Russians have found this out trying to get their gas through Eastern Europe into uh, Western Europe, especially through Ukraine. Uh, so Assad, uh, Assad said in 2010, uh, we, Syria, aren't just important for the Middle East. Uh, 
we link the 4C, so I'll come to the 4C strategy next. Uh, we become the compulsory intersection of the whole world of investment, transport, and more. Asa described the serious nexus as the single largest perimeter of Turkey, Iran, and Russia. We're talking about the center of the world. So essentially, Syria becomes a crossroad for these pipelines. Uh, the pipeline would also give Iran an economic lifeline and increase its leverage uh, and influence in South Asia as well as the Middle East. It would essentially create a hardened link through which Iranian energy would flow into Europe and make Europe dependent uh, on Iranian energy, which would give them essentially more political influence. Okay, so the 4C strategy. This is, this is not a very good picture, I think. It's not a big screen. Uh, but the strategy is essentially to, the 4C strategy envisioned by our side uh, was essentially to link the Black Sea, the Caspian Sea, uh, the Gulf of the Arabian Sea, whatever, and the Caspian Sea. Um, and again, Syria would be the, essentially the transit route through which all these pipelines flow onto Europe. Um, whether or not they link with China is, and their uh, Silk Road is another matter, which is unsettled yet, it's in progress. Um, okay, the Qatar pipeline, <coughs> which was one leg of it. Uh, Qatar is the third largest gas producer in the world behind Russia and Iran, um, with trillions of cubic feet in gas at stake. Uh, in 1989, Qatar, Qatar and Iran began to develop the South Pars North Dome field. I have a map of that coming up next. Um, with 51 trillion cubic meters of gas and 50 billion cubic meters of liquid condensates, it's the largest natural gas field in the world. So it's quite a price. Uh, approximately one third of its riches lie in Iranian waters and two thirds in Qatari waters. Okay. In 2009, Qatar proposed to build a pipeline to send its gas northwest. Uh, via Saudi Arabia, Jordan, and Syria to Turkey. However, Syrian President Bashar al-Assad refused to sign the plan. Russia, which did not want to see its position in the European gas markets undermined, put pressure, intense pressure on Iran to. So again, Russia, although it supports the Syrian government, didn't want to lose its own uh, influence. Uh, so Iran and Qatar, as I've already said, want the same European markets and access through Syria, and that's caused conflict, uh, given Bashar al-Assad's unique I suppose a unique position by now in the Middle East. Uh, okay, so these are the gas fields. Um, there's an estimated 1,800 trillion feet of recoverable gas and gas condensates. The picture on the uh, right is particularly important, I think. This is a picture of the Gulf. Um, South Pass Field, which is this section here, is controlled by Iran. This is controlled by Qatar. Uh, and this is where where all the energy is. Okay, so the international context. Um, the United States attempts to isolate Iran via its pipelines. has been, for well, successive US governments now for decades, well, since 1979, there have been attempts to isolate Iran to overthrow its government, um, isolate its influence in the region. If Iran starts to build pipelines either through Pakistan into Asia or from itself through Syria and to Turkey and Europe, and that ruins essentially US designs on Iran. Um, Russian support for Assad, uh, the naval base of Tardis, um, this is a small map, but that's Tardis there, where the Russians have their naval base, they've had it since the 70s. Um, this also gives, this is of essential importance, of strategic importance to Russia as well since it gives them access to the Mediterranean as well and defies U.S. attempts to isolate their access. Uh, Crimea had a bit to do with that as well. Uh, Russia begins operations in Syria at the, op at the invitation of the Assad government in September 30, 2015. And this caused, as you know, an earthquake in U.S. politics. Um, they did not expect uh, Bashar al-Assad to be supported by Russia. Um, Europe is a key destination for Middle East oil and gas, as I've already stated, and Syria is essentially the transit nation through which these pipelines are proposed to pass. Um, so that's a map of Syria and its regional position. Um, so some conclusions and questions that I think are relevant. Um, 
the current situation in Syria is unsettled. Whether or not a few weeks ago the US was saying Assad could stay, a week later they were saying he had to go again. Okay. Um, he was on the verge of winning the war as well against the jihadists too. Uh, although that's whether or not the US intervenes further. Again, the situation is fluid and it's hard to say. Um, a dangerous geopolitical situation as a reason due to US-Russia confrontation. Um, there are a lot of planes flying over Russia that belong to various different nations. They haven't come into conflict yet, but it's, I think, a legitimate question to ask. Will they, if they do shoot one another, what will happen? We don't know. Um, if Assad does go, what becomes of Syria with Iraq, Libya, Afghanistan in mind? Will it turn into another disastrous failed state? Who would take power in Syria? What would happen? It's still a very unknown question. Uh, how would Iran and Hezbollah uh, and Russia respond to the loss of an important ally such as Assad? Um, Iran, with a pro-US regime in Syria, would lose its access, uh, um, lose access to essentially the rest of the Middle East. Hezbollah would be cut off. Uh, Russia would also conceivably lose its uh, access the port of Tardis and their access to the Mediterranean. Uh, an unstable Syria makes a pipeline unviable for the time being. Um, trying to run a pipeline through a war ravaged country uh, is obviously not viable at the moment. Uh, the balkanization of Syria has also been mentioned, uh, breaking it up into various ethnic, as some of our previous speakers said. Uh, it may be balkanized essentially into various ethnic groups. Um, perhaps that's already happening. It's still a fluid situation. Um, so thank you for listening.